Welcome everyone. I am Tanya Janker from We Hack Purple and today with me is co-host Akira Brand and guest Jeff Williams of Contrast Security. So Jeff has been in security for over 20 years doing tons of stuff in tech. He's also a national basketball um, champion and has to defend his, his championship in a few weeks from now and he has been working in security for a long time. He is one of the founders of Contrast Security and has founded other startup companies within application security. And he's one of the founders of OWASP, which as we know is one of my favorite things on the internet. And so Jeff's gonna talk to us today a bit about Log4j and a bit about RASP and a lot about AppSec. And without further ado, I'm gonna let Jeff take it away. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for doing this. I really like this forum. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about RASP and I want everyone to know about it because it's such a powerful technology that every application and every API on the internet should be using. And by the end of this call, I hope to convince you that you should be using it on your applications and APIs too. So let's get started. I've got a couple of slides I wanna share. But after that, I'm going to start demoing and showing you RASP and how it works on real world apps. But I want to make sure everybody has the right background first. So this is a basic picture of, of how we used to do protection against attacks. And mostly it's at the perimeter. We have web app firewalls and proxies and things like that. And the way they have to work is they have to look at the HTTP request and decide whether it's an attack or whether it's legitimate traffic for that web app. And the problem is, it is impossible. So it used to be a little bit easier in the old days when HTTP requests were pretty simple. They just had name value pairs in them and you could see whether something was, uh, you know, had weird data in it, looked like an attack or not. Uh, it wasn't perfect because it was still often difficult to detect attacks, but it was much better. But modern web applications and web APIs take a bunch of different kinds of data. It's not just simple name value pairs, it's XML and JSON and serialized objects and uh, uh, GraphQL and all kinds of WebSocket, all kinds of different data formats. And modern applications take data through a bunch of different sources. It's not all coming in through the front door anymore. There's backend connections and backend APIs from other systems. It might be coming in from a queue or uh, a, an API that you use. So there's lots of different ways into modern apps and WAFs only protect the, the front door, the HTTP connection. So even simple things like this uh, simple SQL injection kind of attack are a little bit complicated to deal with. Uh, you don't really know what this, this little brief chunk of special characters represents. And so ultimately, even a human today can't look at web traffic and decide whether something's an attack or not. And so it's very unlikely that a WAF sitting at the perimeter can do that. So we had a better idea. We thought, hey, you know what? Maybe there's a better way of identifying uh, attacks, not at the perimeter, but let's let them proceed into an application and see how the application deals with them. So with RASP, what you do is you add a, a component to your application server. And when your application starts up, it instruments your application, the whole thing, the framework, the libraries, the code that you wrote, the whole, the, the app server, everything that's there gets instrumented for security. And basically what that means is we're inserting these sensors into the various layers of an application. And using that visibility, you can really see what's going on from a security perspective. So uh, in this example, we added these sensors to the various layers. Uh, and when we see an attack event come in through HTTP, we can see, oh, well, you know, the controller probably grabbed some data and then maybe somebody validated it a little bit. Maybe it was good or bad validation. That data might flow through into a session or get used in business logic, but eventually it goes to the, the data layer here and 
gets built into a SQL query and that query gets sent to the database. So what the, the RASP does is the RASP says, hey, I see some untrusted data that flowed right into a query that's going to the database. Let me check to see whether that data modified the meaning of the SQL query. And that's the key is a WAF can't do this because a WAF has no idea what it's protecting. It doesn't know how these this attack data is used by the application. RASP does know that. So RASP here can see, hey, this data actually changed this, the semantics of this query. You can see it added a new or clause uh, that's always returns true because one plus three is, or one plus two is always greater than negative one. That changed the meaning of this query. And so, uh, the RASP can clearly see that. That should never happen. An attacker should never be able to change the meaning of your query. And so when this happens, that's when RASP intervenes and says, hey, nope, we're not gonna send that query to the database. We're gonna prevent it from leaving your application. And so you stay safe, application keeps working, attacks get identified and prevented. So that's the, the basics of RASP here. Now, a more complicated situation is something like unsafety serialization. So this is an attack that's a little more complicated. In this attack, uh, an attacker a, a, a attacker puts together a malicious object that he serializes and then sends over the network. The application is expecting to receive this object. It's like a user object that has a name and a record ID and an owner, but the bad guy puts together a malicious object that's of a, a special type that has commands inside it. And so when the application receives it and tries to deserialize it, the attack will fire. And so the, uh, the attack will, in this case, launch the, the uh, calc command. The reason it's so difficult for a WAF is if you look at this HTTP request, you can see it's just a base64 encoded binary class. Uh, uh, object here. And so there's no way for a WAF to look inside this and go, hey, inside that serialized object, there is un, you know, dangerous stuff. So the WAF can't do anything. You need something inside the application that prevents this serialized object from actually being deserialized and causing this attack to run. So that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at this whole situation uh, and see how we can use RASP to prevent these kinds of attacks. RASP uh, actually prevents a whole broad range of attacks. We, you know, I talked about SQL injection and unsafety serialization, but it also works on path traversal, command injection, uh, no SQL injection, uh, expression language injection, uh, XXE, and cross-site request forgery, whole broad range of attacks. So let's, uh, let's pause here. I'm gonna come back to that slide. Let's let's pause here and let's jump into some some demonstrations. So I'm going to use contrast to demonstrate how RASP works. Oh, there's a there's a quick question in the chat. So Juan yeah, is saying, so are the RASP sensors code within the app or another application running alongside the main application? It's a little of both, actually. They're all inside one application. Um, that, so what happens is as the application starts up, RASP will instrument the code of that application just the same way that a tool like New Relic or App Dynamics might do with, uh, you know, for performance management purposes. So those sensors go in into the actual application. And then there's also some other, you know, analysis code. Uh, like the brains that runs inside that application as well. And so as the sensors fire, they're sending this stream of events to the, the brain. And then the brain is making smart decisions about whether something is an attack or not. And it all runs in line, which is kind of how you want it. You don't want to have to send security decisions to some external source to, to decide because you'll slow your app way down. RASP is designed to be super, super fast, probably faster than if you wrote your own input validation or your own protection because they're highly optimized. Um, so yeah, it all run, part, runs as part of one application. And I want you to just imagine what this looks like at scale. Imagine you've got hundreds or thousands of applications out there. It's very difficult 
in the modern world to try to put a perimeter around those. You know, maybe you've got pieces that are running in Amazon and some in Azure, and you've got some pieces running in containers in uh, your private cloud, and then you've got some other pieces that are on-prem. Very difficult to put effective parameters or, or per perimeters around that. That's kind of the, the notion behind zero trust. And unfortunately, zero trust is really only about which servers can access what other servers and what users are, are involved. It doesn't really do anything at application layer. So RASP is a way of achieving that zero trust at the application layer, and it's distributed across all of your servers. So you don't have any central points of failure here. Um, ben has a follow-up question. Yep. So he was asking basically if WAF fails open, um, so here's, so he put a, a lot of stuff. So we've discussed before about the merits of WAF versus RASP. And he was saying, I can't recall the reason not to use WAF. That's making assumptions. So I'll just yeah. leave that there. Um, but basically like, because only having one layer of defense is not smart. And I don't, I don't think that's the reason, but he was saying, but does it fail open? And I wasn't sure if WAFs fail open. I think that might be product to product. It, it is product to product. Generally, WAFs don't fail open. Uh, yeah. Like routers and, and firewalls tend to fail open um, if they get overloaded because their, their primary responsibility is to make those apps work. But uh, the big problem with WAF, the reason you shouldn't rely on WAF is because they make mistakes. They overblock and they underblock. So they overblock because they think things that aren't attacks are attacks. They'll see, you know, a complicated JSON document coming through and they'll say, hey, well, that, that field has a semicolon and a, a single tick in it. So it must be SQL injection. When in reality, that data isn't a SQL injection attack. It never goes, that data never goes anywhere near a SQL query. It's harmless. And it's what the application expected. That's overblocking. People get really irritated when WAFs overblock because then they break applications and you have to go tune your policy and it's complicated. And I know many organizations have teams of people that that's what they do is they tune WAFs to make sure that they don't overblock. But underblocking is also really, really dangerous. And many times WAFs miss attacks because they don't understand the application that's being protected. And so, uh, you know, even that SQL injection attack that we looked at a second ago, that's an expression, a SQL expression. You can make that arbitrarily complex. Like we did, you know, one plus two is less than negative one or greater than negative one. Uh, but you could add terms to that and make it as complicated as you want. And ultimately many WAFs fail in the log4j and uh, spring for, for shell attacks. Attackers very quickly figured out a zillion ways to bypass WAF rules and send those attacks through um, because you know they can camouflage the attacks in a whole bunch of different ways. Great questions. All right, so let's take a look at, uh, at RASP here. So I'm using Contrast, and the first step is to install the Contrast agent on your application server. And once you do this, it's it's there forever. It's always gonna be protecting, but I just wanna give you a sense here. Here's the languages that we support. I'll just list this up here. You can grab an agent for Java, which includes Kotlin and Scala, .NET, .NET Core, Node, Ruby, Python, uh, Go, uh, and we just launched PHP. We've got a lot of different language coverage. And so I'll show you how we do this. So. Um, I am going to pull up uh, my app here. I have it running already, but I'm going to kill it, start over. So the first step is you can go download the contrast agent. I'm going to download it with curl. Uh, contrast agents in all the major repositories. This one's in Maven Central. So you can just grab this contrast.jar file and download it. And once you have it, then uh, you're ready to go. The next thing you do, need to do is tell Java to use it. So in this case, I'm gonna set this environment variable called Java tool options. And it's just gonna add this Java agent with contrast.jar uh, to tell Java to use my agent every time it launches. And then the rest is like, hey, we're gonna launch it on port 98, okay? 
And now I just run my application the normal way. Like I'm just running, this is a Spring Boot application, just run it exactly the normal way. And you can see as it starts up, contrasts loads here, get a little banner. It says, hey, we're going to uh, start protecting this application. And so I'll just give that a second to start up and I actually have this application already running without contrast on port 8080. And I just wanted to demonstrate uh, how this attack works. This field here actually has a, a hibernate injection flaw in it. And if you're using contrast assess, we would have told you exactly where this vulnerability was. Um, but I can just use this uh, application normally. When I try to put an attack uh, into this, And exploit this vulnerability and steal all the records out of the database. Okay, so that's a SQL injection style attack. And, uh, and I've, I exploited it to, to grab all the data out of the application. I could actually use this flaw to you know, take over the whole database. So now let's bring up the one that's running with contrast protect engaged. Same application. And again, you can use this application normally. You'll never know that contrast is here. Contrast is incredibly fast. Um, and oops. so you don't know that's, notice that it's there, but if I try that same attack again, contrast will intervene and prevent that query from going to the database, exactly like the example I just gave. So now when we go to the contrast dashboard, we could go to the attacks tab. And I'll just give you a brief tour here. So this is showing me that, hey, I've got seven attackers in the last day. Uh, if I zoom out to like 30 days, you can see it's you know, a whole bunch of attackers. You can see all the different types of attacks that I've been receiving. And you can see which applications have been targeted with attacks. Now, uh, most of these are green. The green ones have been blocked by contrast. The red ones have been exploited by contrast uh, or by, by the attacker. And the reason is that you can deploy RASP in a log mode. And so that's what these red ones are. This is applications that if you turned on contrast protect, it would have blocked these attacks. So you can zoom in on these different uh, attack areas. Like if I wanna see just XXE, I can pull up you know, the list of just the XXE attacks. I wanna go to, uh, to show everything here and show these are the actual attack events and I'll just show all of them. So here you can see you know, a bunch of different attacks across uh, these different applications. And uh, so let me refresh here, get the right data. And uh, here's the attack that we just blocked. So you can see here contrast intervened because it saw this attack come in in this uh, in the last name parameter, it flowed through the application and that data ended up in this SQL query. So a WAF would only see this and it would have to decide whether to block it or not based on this HTTP request. And frankly, you know, we don't know how this data is going to be used. We don't know that it's going to go to a database if we're a WAF, but with RASP, we actually trace that data all the way into the query and you can see clearly this modified the meaning of the query. It changed it so that this, this where clause always returns true, which means that we'll see all, all the different records in the database. So we know we've got SQL injection is the point. So RASP is much more accurate because it directly measures these attacks as they happen. And another differentiator here is RASP uh, can also see more details about the attack. So on this tab, you can see here, we see the full stack trace for this. We know exactly what file, source code file this is in, and we can see the whole stack trace of how this code got uh, compromised by oh, the attacker. Sorry, we have a quick question. Yeah, um, go ahead. So like Ben typed this in the chat, but I, I missed it for a second. So he was yeah. saying, so around a minute ago, when you engaged RASP and then repeated the SQL injection, you saw the SQL detected message. Oh yeah, let me talk about that for a second. Okay. So this, this application 
happens to show this is the spring pet clinic it's kind of like a sample uh demo kind of application for spring boot um this application happens to take exception messages and print them to the screen that's how it any exception that happens that's what it's going to do but most applications don't do that and what rasp does is it creates an exception inside your application very similar to if that sql call had failed for some reason like if the database was down it would throw an exception and say hey i can't reach the database that's exactly what happens most applications will eat that exception and come up with some nice way of handling it so they'll you know they won't display the message to the screen that kind of tells the attacker that they successfully attacked you you probably don't want to do that most applications don't show those you know exception messages right on the screen they they show a custom message that says you know maybe uh request failed uh see you know contact your system administrator or, or something like that you don't want to tell the the attacker like hey we detected you attacking us we're calling the cops because um, that's a dead giveaway that uh, you, you know that they're doing it Probably a great reaction would be to not only block this attack, but you know, look at this user and say, hey, why is this user account being used to attack me? Hey, let's maybe think about uh, disabling their login or canceling their sessions or something like that. Did that answer the question, Ben? Oh, so he says, okay. Okay, good. Yeah. I okay, so these are some simple attacks. And I wanted to show you some examples of some more complicated attacks. So um, I have a, uh, an application here that's uh, a little more complicated. It's a little more modern. This is um, an API, a set of APIs that work together as an application. So we call it the API bookstore. And it's really three different APIs. There's a front end, which is written in JAX-RS that will allow you to add and list and delete books. There's a data manager, which is more like the, the database uh, API where you can add and update and list books and things like that. And then there's a debug API that offers uh, like ping and some other environment kind of details. So all you have to do is add contrast to this uh, the way that I did for the other application. And, uh, and then you can protect APIs. And just API security is really, really important because more than uh, probably two thirds of the applications that are out there these days are actually APIs on the server side and rich JavaScript client on the, the browser side uh, or the mobile phone side. And so, you know, modern app security is API security, if you will. So I've got this, this running and I'm gonna send some curl requests here. So the first one I'm gonna send is just a request to get the books that are in the database now. Currently there's two books in the database. And I'm going to send a serialized object here to add a book. So one of the APIs here uses a serialized object. I, I took the liberty of serializing a book object before the call. And now I'm just going to post it to this update API. And so I, I sent that up there. And now when I list the books, you'll see now I've got three. I added great expectations to the, the book list. OK, well, that's all fine. But let's try exploiting this. Let's send a, a bad book. So this bad book is actually malicious. It doesn't have a book in it at all. It actually has some custom what are called gadgets. They're instances of classes that can be abused to take control of an application. So in this case, uh, let's, let's send this serialized object. And what happened was we get an error message back, but our attack worked anyway. So in this case, what happened is uh, the the class got deserialized, and uh, what it was designed to do was to touch a file in the root uh, in the temp directory. So I'm just going to do Docker ps. This is running on Docker. So I'm going to get the container ID here for the data manager, and then we're just going to uh, do. Uh, let me see if I've got it here, so I don't have to type it all again. Nope. <laughs> nice. Okay, we'll just do it. Docker. Yes. Uh, Docker exec. The, our container, and then we'll just do ls-al slash temp. And you can see here, 
we've got this hacked file. That's what this attack was designed to do is just touch this hacked file. I could have done whatever I want with this serialized object. I could have completely taken over this system. This is one of the techniques that was used by log4j attackers, as well as spring for shell attackers to use unsafe deserialization to compromise uh, applications. So let's look at how uh, we deal with that with, uh, um, with RASP. So I'm going to launch this application. The last time I just launched it with Docker Compose up. This time I'm going to tell it to use a Docker Compose that includes contrast. And it's exactly the same thing. We're just, we really literally are using the Java tool options again on all three of the APIs that we're trying to protect here. <laughs> you guys are silly in the chat. <laughs> yeah, we talk about cheese a lot. <laughs> okay, I got you. I don't understand, but that's fine. The long running joke from the first season of the We Hack Purple <laughs> podcast, there was a question that was always about cheese. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It was, I was trying to describe, ask how much money a certain job makes, but without saying, tell us your exact salary. And so it's like, you know, when I became a software developer and I went to the grocery store and I realized I could afford two types of cheese, I was like, I've made it. I don't even have to think about exactly how much my groceries cost anymore. I make enough. I can just buy whatever food I want this week. And I felt right, right, like right, that right, was, right. yeah. And so we would be like, can you afford as much cheese as you want? <laughs> And not all jobs in cybersecurity can. Right, right, right. That is truly weird. This is great, Jeff. Please continue. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, no, it's quite all right. Okay, so uh, this takes a second to start up, but uh, I, think, I think we're up and going now. Yeah, so um, let's just check, make sure it's working. We're listing the books we got. I started it over so we don't have that book again. Let's add a, uh, a, a great expectations again. We can add a couple other books here too as well because I want you to see the funny titles. So you guys are so silly. Um, so now when we list the books, um, you can see uh, a, paradise, a pair of dice lost and uh, a serial thriller, so on. Let's add that um, malicious book or a bad book, okay? This time, notice that we get an error message again, but this time Rasp, said, hey, deserialization attack detected. If I look at the stack trace here, you can see exactly what, what happened. You can see deserialization attack detected. So we're gonna block that deserialization from happening. So we're protected. And if you actually look down here in the code, you can actually see you know, the full stack trace from exactly where this request came in. You can see uh, a, a mapping. So actually the way that Spring for Shell worked was very similar to this. We're trying to map an object to uh, a data structure in memory. And uh, in, the log, in the Spring for Shell case, uh, we were trying to overwrite a field, you know, sort of access a field that's not supposed to be public, in that case, the module slash class loader. Here, we're just trying to load a malicious class entirely. But Bottom line here, uh, RASP did us right. RASP protected us here so that now uh, when I go back to my contrast dashboard, I can look at the attacks again, and uh, I'll just go straight to the attack events here. You can see here's that untrusted deserialization attempt. You can see uh, block the attack. You can see all the details uh, of the stack trace. And you can even see, of course, the full uh, HTTP request here if you wanna replay this or make sure that you understand what happened. So let's think about what, what we just did here. We just added a single component to our app server that gives us protection against this broad range of attacks. Imagine if you could take all the injections off the table today, how would that affect the way that you build code? Would you be as worried about having a SQL injection in your application if you know that you're protected in production? Maybe you'd treat it a little differently. What about you know, new open source library vulnerabilities? How would that change how you do things? Would you have to uh, you know, have a fire drill every time a new problem in Spring or Log4J comes out? Uh, 
Or would you be able to just deal with that and say, okay, we've we've got a new vulnerability, we're going to fix it, but we've we're protected in product, production against being exploited. So having RASP in place to me is like having belt and suspenders. It gives you much more likelihood that you'll be able to stay safe. I I've worked with it. Uh, yeah, go ahead. We have a question. Of, sorry, bad timing. We have a question no, no, about just, like, so as new attacks come out, can RASP update itself without having to reset yeah. the the app itself? It's a great question. So the first thing that you should know is that most of RASP's protections are fundamental. They're like, so the, the ones that we've looked at so far, SQL injection, XXC, and unsafe deserialization, the defense in RASP is fundamental. The specific exploit doesn't matter. So there's not this race about having to keep up with the latest attacks all the time. We're taking these whole classes of vulnerability off the table. So the, the only analogy I can think of really is, if you remember in the early 2000s, there were kernel exploits all the time, buffer overflows and uh, attacks like that, that were taking over various kernels. And uh, some researchers invented a couple of new techniques that helped ASLR and DEP, so address-based randomization and data execution prevention. Those two techniques made it much, much more difficult to exploit buffer overflows and other kind of memory-related attacks. And so we, it, the number of kernel exploits went from you know one a week down to very rare these days. And this is what RASP can do for web-style attacks. So for all these categories of attacks that we've been talking about, uh, injection and all the rest, RASP can make those very difficult to exploit. And you don't have to, to sort of keep up with the latest specific exploit. Uh, for instance, uh, contrast protected against both log4j and uh, the spring for shell attacks before the vulnerability was even announced, before anybody even knew it was there. Because both in both of those attacks, uh, it was unsafe deserialization and expression language injection that were getting exploited. And contrast prevents those from happening. So uh, RASP is this fundamental technique that eliminates whole classes of vulnerabilities. So just think about that. Well, how would your program change if you could take, even if you could just take SQL injection off the table forever? What a massive improvement that would be for your program. And I'm not suggesting that you don't go back and fix your code and make sure that you've got uh, you know, solid code hygiene. I think the smart approach is to do both. You're always gonna have vulnerabilities in your, in your development environment that are, that are coming through into production. It's very difficult to make a program that's perfect at that, particularly with new zero day vulnerabilities and libraries being discovered and, and so on. So you can have a great code hygiene program. I think you should, it's really important. But at the same time, you also have to have good protections in place in production. And even if you were perfect at blocking every attack, it's still really nice to know who's attacking you and what kind of attacks they're sending at you. That's the threat intelligence that you can use. And I encourage you to feed this data back to development because nothing makes development teams take security more seriously than, than you saying, hey, that SQL injection vulnerability I told you about, well, it's being attacked in production right now. Uh, so this is much more accurate risk information than what you can get from, you know, if somebody discovers a, a I don't know, say a file injection uh, or a path traversal kind of vulnerability in your app, and they say it's a medium, well, okay, it's a medium. It probably goes on a backlog. It gets fixed in, I don't know, months. I just the average time to fix vulnerabilities using static analysis is 290 days. So the vulnerability is going to be around for a while. But imagine that same vulnerability, but now you have data from production that says, "Hey, attackers are hitting this all the time on this application and other applications. It's just a matter of time before they get." you know, they, they connect the dots and figure out how to exploit this. 
that makes it not just a medium, it makes it a critical because it's currently under attack. And that's the kind of data that I want you to use in your risk management program to make smart decisions about where you spend your efforts in AppSec. And uh, Tanya, that's that's true. That's uh, that's one of the major static analysis vendors puts that out in their annual report. They say, hey, it's 290 days on average to fix vulnerabilities using static. I asked, by the way, is eight days, which is still too long, frankly. The ideal time, and we do have a number of customers that have done this, uh, they're fixing in less than a day. That's the most cost-effective way of doing application security is get accurate feedback back to developers, let them fix it right away. Uh, but RASP can help. I mean, think about uh, how RASP can affect your program if you've got hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of vulnerabilities sitting out there waiting to be triaged, waiting to be fixed. Uh, you're awfully vulnerable. Any questions on uh, what I've shown so far? So far, we're agreeing that 290 days is way too long, <laughs> um, but there's no actual yeah. questions. We're all just, I might be just shocked. <laughs> That's a long time to be open and vulnerable. That's scary. Well, if you think about DevSecOps is if it's taking you 290 days to fix vulnerabilities, you are gonna pile up a huge number of vulnerabilities. Yeah. And so your backlog is gonna be I know many of organizations that carry tens of thousands of application vulnerabilities in their backlog, and it's just not healthy. It's uh, it means that none of those vulnerabilities are really ever going to get fixed. They're going to do whatever they can to try to you know backlog them, eliminate them, call them closed, say they're false positive, whatever. Um, yeah, I've worked at a lot of places, Jeff, where yeah. there's just thousands and thousands, and I'm like. Do you want to just throw this app in the garbage and start again? Is that the plan? Because the plan can't be do nothing. Right. Or if that is the plan, I don't live, I don't work here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the plan should be to get to what I call healthy. Uh, I call it the new normal. It's like, you've got to work off that backlog and RASP can help you. I mean, RASP is a, a, a kind of countermeasure, right? It's a compensating control. And uh, you need to work off that backlog and get to a point where you can start focusing on speeding up the feedback loop so that when you discover a new vulnerability, you get it to the person that needs it through the tools they're already using and they can fix it. And yeah. that's a healthy lifestyle. I agree, Jeff. I agree. I feel like sometimes businesses think, well, if we just ignore it, it'll go away. And it's like, that that's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I just, I'm just nodding my head a lot. You can't see, but I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else have more questions for Jeff? Cause he just showed us a lot. I'm not seeing anything pop up in the chat. Are there a few more things you wanna show us? Or sure. we can get, oh, of course. So someone, QN says, does this integrate into some ticketing systems, perhaps JIRA? Yeah, great question. So, uh, and this isn't specific to RASP. Like typically, RASP you want to integrate into your SIM, and maybe into uh, you know response systems like PagerDuty and things like that, um, because you you know you may want to start an incident response based on the the attack. Um, but yeah, Contrast integrates into a whole ton of different things, and you know everything I've shown you here in this dashboard is driven by REST API. So you can hook it up to whatever you want, but we offer a ton of integrations into things like Jira, all kinds of bug trackers, all the IDEs, uh, Slack, uh, CICD systems. Most, you know, a lot of what we do is on the, you know, the sort of the shift left side with IAST and SAST and serverless. And then, you know, we also offer RASP along with those. And uh, so I just want to show like kind of, I want you to think about, AppSec differently, like, and I do have a slide about this, I think. Um, so this is our, our platform. And I want you to think about the assess process, like the, the people call it SCA software, uh, I'm sorry, uh, AST, application security testing. You, you want to be able to show, we want to be sure that you're detecting vulnerabilities as early as possible and quickly. 
Contrast also includes software composition analysis. So we're analyzing libraries and we do something a little different here. For us, this is one thing. Doing AST and SCA should always be done together so that when you analyze the application, you're analyzing it for custom code vulnerabilities and library vulnerabilities at the same time. Because frankly, you can't do one without the other. And it's just weird to me that in the market, there's separate products for this with the exception of contrast because understanding custom code vulnerabilities demands that you understand the libraries that are in that application and how they're used and vice versa. If you want to understand open source, you have to understand how the application uses those libraries. I think 62% uh, of libraries are never used in your application. Like they're, they're packaged into it, but they're never actually called. They're just dead code. And so, you know, I really want you to think about focusing on the libraries that are actually active. That's that other 38% of the libraries. And even within those 38%, only 31% of that, of the used libraries are actually called. So with contrast, we can show you exactly what classes are used in every library in your application. So you can focus on what matters. And then of course there's, there's protect, uh, which we spent a lot of time talking about. I did want to talk to you really quickly about, about this. Most, you know, WAFs only protect the front door. So here's an expression language injection attack. And imagine the attacker sends in the attack and it goes right to the EL engine and it runs. Well, a WAF might be able to see that front door. Expression language is kind of complicated, so it's, it might sneak by, but that's the front door path. But this back door path is wide open to attackers. Uh, if they can get past the, you know, in, into this environment, like maybe they can put data into your database. Well, a WAF isn't going to stop an attack that's in your database from reaching the expression language engine, but RASP can. RASP is inside your application and it can tell, hey, look, this data that came from the database flowed to the EL engine and tried to trick the EL engine into doing something harmful, like runtime.exec. So, your expression should never be calling runtime.exec. That's crazy. Expressions are for like, you know, generating UI stuff. <laughs> and so uh, this kind of sandbox is another way that RASP protects your applications. We have one question yes, that's like right about what you're talking about. So Leroy asks, does RASP also emulate attacks against an app based on dependencies, programming languages, et cetera, to detect issues? That maybe a DAS tool might miss. I think he means I asked. Probably, but... yeah. So, yeah, and people get this confused all the time because I asked and RASP are based on the same instrumentation technology. So, I asked is for detecting vulnerabilities, RASP is for detecting attacks. But I think about it this way like, imagine you mounted a camera over a window in your house. That camera could see that you left the window open and report it to you, right? That would be reporting a vulnerability. But that same camera could also see a guy breaking in through that window and stealing your stuff. That's detecting an attack, but it's the same camera. And in essence, that's what I asked and RASP are doing. They're installing the cameras. It's the brain that looks at the events coming from those cameras and interprets them and says, hey, here's what's going on. Does that help? I, I think so, definitely. But so, Leroy, so you let me know in the chat if that's okay. Yeah, so to answer the question is RASP doesn't detect vulnerabilities. RASP just identifies attacks. And you can use them separately, by the way. But I asked, does detect vulnerabilities, but it detects them in a way that doesn't require you to exploit those vulnerabilities, the way that DAS does. So it's it's a little bit, some people try to say it's a combination of static and dynamic. It's actually, that's not a great way of describing it, but it does have some of the advantages of both. You can just add it to your application. This is IAST we're talking about, or interactive application security testing. You just add it to your application and then you do your normal development process. You do your normal testing, whether it's automated or manual. And IAST is in the background detecting vulnerabilities really accurately because we've got cameras mounted over all the windows. Um, so anyway, that's, that's that. He said that is a great clarification. Thank you. 
cool. And you, does everybody get RASP now? If I, if uh, if you don't want to go run out and install this on your applications right now, then I didn't do my job because I think it's actually crazy that people are running web apps and web APIs without RASP on them. It's very accurate. It's very fast. It's a distributed solution, so it moves wherever your applications go. You know, you can. In, it doesn't matter where the app is deployed. It runs in containers, it runs in the cloud, it runs in a data center. So wherever your apps are, that's where your RASP engine goes. And it gives you this great visibility. So let me know if you're skeptical, I wanna hear about like, what, what makes you skeptical about this? Like, why wouldn't you do this? What does testing look, or what does tuning look like? So for instance, like yeah. if someone's trying to do the instrumentation to set this up and then they're trying to tune it to make sure that it's working correctly. What does that effort level or how do you do it? Yeah, what I do is uh, I and, and look, RASP doesn't involve a lot of tuning because it's much more specific to the the uh, the, the definition of the attacks than something like WAF. WAF is trying to match signatures. And so it has to do a lot of guessing about whether something's an attack or not. But like the examples that I showed you, uh, we stop attacks, RASP stops attacks when they violate the, the sort of the behavior that should never happen within an application. So like for SQL injection, I showed you, you know, when the attacker is able to change the meaning of the SQL query, that's when contrast would intervene and block it because that should never ever happen. Your users should never change the meaning of a query. That would be crazy. And so uh, there's not a lot of tuning, but to test it, to make sure that, that RASP isn't gonna break my applications, I usually put it on a test environment and I install it and I run my whole test suite. I verify that all my functionality is working, all my test cases pass. Usually it doesn't, it usually uh, is exactly the same as when you run it normally. And then I have a lot of confidence putting it into production. Sometimes I'll put it into production in, uh, in log mode so that you can just watch it for a week and see that, oh yeah, it's detecting stuff. Uh, you know, the average application gets attacked 13,000 times a month. And so you'll see stuff right away that you didn't know was there before because you get a lot of visibility. And then once I have confidence that, uh, you know, I, I, haven't, I haven't logged anything that shouldn't have been blocked, then I'll turn it on blocking mode. And so what does the setup look like? Like the idea of like um, connecting it to an app, is that a long time or I guess you, you explained some, but I've had some people say like, oh, but how long is that gonna take? Is that hard? Can I do that myself? Yeah, I actually showed you at the beginning of the talk, but it went pretty quick. So you might've missed it. Um, when I set it up for pet clinic, I'll just do it again. So you can see exactly the process. Remember the first step was just to download the agent. So this is for Java, it's basically the same for the other languages, but you can see, you know, it's uh, this is a small jar file. Then I set an environment variable telling Java to use that new jar file that I just downloaded. So here I downloaded contrast.jar. Here I'm telling contrast to use, I'm telling Java to use contrast.jar. And then I run my application the normal way, just java-jar, to this application and it starts up and now uh, RASP is engaged. Well, you can put this into, I, I suggest, you know, rather than doing it on an app by app basis, what you do is you add contrast to your standard app server and API server builds. So like if you typically deploy in Docker, there's an easy way to add this to Docker. So it always runs. If you normally use a, a cloud environment, like uh, say, uh, like a, PaaS, Azure. a platform as a service, would it work with that? Yep. Nice. Yeah, we've got really great integrations into both Azure and AWS. So you can add it, uh, you know, with a single click to your environments there. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. I guess it was so fast. I just assumed there was more. <laughs> Well, setting up a WAF would take you a long time, right? You'd have to put it in yeah. learn mode and then you'd have to deal with all the exceptions and you'd want to run it in log mode for a while. Uh, RASP is much different than that. I mean, the amount of, of human effort involved is dramatically less. 
That's why we were asking. So great question, Melissa. Thank you so much. Awesome. Are there any more questions for Jeff? Like this is our chance to quiz the guy that made this. <laughs> I feel like it's an opportunity, right? And isn't there, um, don't you have a community version of this? So if you just want to do one app or something? Oh, we do actually. You can go to, um, I think if you search for contrast community edition, if I could spell, you can go to contrast community edition and try it free. So you can sign up for an account and I think it supports uh, some small number of applications for free with full protection. You get both uh, IAST, SCA and, a set, and uh, Protect. So you get RASP and IAST and SCA all, uh, all taken care of. So for instance, if someone happens to be an open source developer and they just work on one app, this might be a thing that they could try out? I, I would. I mean, <laughs> uh, it's, if you're writing you know, APIs or web apps, Contrast is really appropriate. And I guarantee you'll learn something. When you add Contrast Protect onto a, an application, you're gonna learn a lot about what the attack world looks like because you'll immediately get all this data that you didn't have before. You know, I, I actually really love the confidence that I get when I look at this and I can look back at you know, the last 30 days and see like, oh, look, there's 982 attacks. And I can dig in and I can see, oh, which ones were actually effective? Uh, and oh, let me pull out to the whole range here. You can see which ones, you know, I can see all of them. I can see which ones were blocked. The probes are interesting. These are attacks that never landed, by the way. They're, they're, they look like attacks, but they never actually connected with their corresponding vulnerability. That's a huge advantage over WAFs, is WAFs would have to block all of these, and that's why they break stuff. But you can see, you know, you'll see a lot of people still doing attacks like, you know, against particular CVEs. Uh, we see an awful lot of uh, log for shell traffic still, and a lot of spring for shell traffic. It's, it's interesting to just see what people are trying, you know? Yeah. We have a question from Akira. Akira, you want to come on? Yeah, Jeff, on that note, I'm kind of curious, like, what direction you think RAST is heading? Um, yeah. And also, like, if you see more people adapting it and what might have to be done or, like, maybe what kind of features would have to be added so that this has, like, a very widespread adaption. Yeah. Um, so Contrast has you know, quite a number of very large enterprise customers. Um, and that's where we're seeing lots of RASP adoption. So I'm not gonna name any names, but there's a number of companies that have put this on all of their public facing applications. Like probably your insurance company uses contrast RASP on all their public facing apps and APIs. Uh, we have a number of customers that use it on thousands of applications. Uh, like one of the world's biggest medical device manufacturers. Oh, and you might find this interesting is, uh, I'll just say uh, one of the major uh, construction tool equipment vendors uh, uses Contrast Protect on all their APIs. And the reason it's interesting is because uh, you wouldn't think of like construction equipment, like why is that using Protect? Why do they care so much about AppSec? Well, it turns out that modern tools are all Internet of Things devices. They're all internet enabled and they're calling serverless functions, they're calling APIs and they need protection on all that stuff. So I guess the question to, you know, what does RASP need to do is uh, it just needs uh, more publicity. Like people need to be thinking about it more as part of a comprehensive AppSec strategy um, it is already required in NIST 853, as well as the PCI software security framework. Um, and so I'm optimistic that, you know, PCI SSF is going into effect uh, in, I want to say August or something is the, like the last time you could ever do an old PCI PADSS assessment. So from now on, it's the new software security framework. And you should get familiar with it if you're in AppSec, because it much different. It's not just a simple list of requirements. It's like, hey, you got to do threat modeling. You got to do runtime protection. There's a bunch of uh, kind of new things. So I think we'll see a surge of it towards, uh, you know, as we as we move towards the second half of the year. 
And that's from NIST or that's from? The SSF is uh, the PCI, okay. the Payment Cardholder Industry. Okay, perfect. So it's any system that processes credit cards for any purpose has okay. to be compliant. It's actually how WAF got started, uh, you know, 15 years ago was uh, it was required by the PCI and it, it just yeah. forced everyone to get a piece uh, a WAF. And yeah, uh, yeah, because originally it, it was like a pen test or a WAF, right? And then I guess they're a code review it or a WAF actually, which was a what uh, or a WAF? It was a code review. Oh, okay. I mean, and then some right scanner there. vendors said, oh, well, isn't running a DAS scan, isn't that a code review? And PCI sort of waffled and eventually gave in. But ulti, uh, you know, originally it was supposed to be a code review, which I was psyched for because really I'm a big I'm a big fan of actually looking at the code. There is a bunch of questions coming in. So QN asks, Question. can you export attack IP address details so that you can use that yeah. in the rest of your network or block them? Yes, uh, you can connect this directly to your SIM, which is a nice way of exporting it and then including it in with all your other uh, sort of network layer attack stuff, or you could just export it from contrast. And like I said, everything in contrast is accessible via REST API. Uh, okay, we're all trying to like look up the, um, the standard that you said so that we can get it right. And Juan adds, I'm starting a new position in the next couple of months in product security. So RASP is something I'm going to bring up. Awesome. This is what you need to look for is the, the PCI SSF. Oops, I went to the wrong place. Uh, if you look in here, I'm sure you can find that. Let me see. Cool. There's a bunch of stuff around the SSF. I don't know where the right entry point is to this, but uh, I'm on the task force that helped create the, the SSF standards. That is a good place to be, being on the, the board so that you can help push things forward, actually get stuff done. What? I'm doing a lot more of that work lately. I'm working with NIST, I'm working with PCI, I'm working with OASIS on the Serif standard. Um, so I'm, uh, I think there's a couple others. So I, I think it's important to get these standards right so that you know people yes. have the right direction. Absolutely. Well, and like, if you don't do the work, who will? Like, that's a big problem in our industry is like, we don't have that many standards. We don't have that many things that are, like eventually I, I that maybe this is an unpopular opinion, but I would love things to just be like mandated. Like, I, like if there's a regulation and we all have to follow it, and so then I'm not sitting there at some giant enterprise telling them like, no, you have to have some secure coding going on. You have to have a secure system development life cycle. It's not okay that every single person in your office shares their code in random places. You have no idea where any of it is and that you're all using random technology stacks and that like there's no system development life cycle that every single person follows. It's just like, a, like cats just like crawling all over your building, just doing whatever they want. I'm like, there has to be some order here if you want things to be secure. End rant. <laughs> Actually, so I, I mean, not to be argumentative, because I, I, mm -hmm. I think uh, there's a lot of, there are a lot of organizations that can succeed that way. But to me, it's all about the outcomes. And frankly, I don't care how you get there. But at the end of the day, what matters to me is, did you convince me with a compelling argument that you've identified the threats, you've got defenses in place against those threats, and you verify that those threats are correct, or that those defenses are correct and effective. If you do that, then I'm happy. And I don't really care if you're, you know, you can have a bunch of different projects building software a bunch of different ways and still do that. The problem I think is that too many people try to over-specify how you have to build software. And frankly, it's not security's job to tell people how to build software. We should be in the business of saying what's good enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When everyone is doing every single thing differently and you can't make sure that there's a time or an opportunity for you to like be able to install a RASP or IS or have the option to do a code review because you have no idea they're even doing a project. 
I mean, like, I would say it's their job to produce that evidence that says that they are secure against the threat that's threats that matter for them. So if it's the PCI, they care a lot about uh, encryption of, of cardholder data. So if the development project produces compelling evidence that says, hey, we've, we track our credit card numbers wherever we go, uh, wherever they go, and we've encrypted them properly in all the places, and here's the proof, then I don't care. I don't have to review the code. They, if they've proved it to me, then I'm happy. Yeah. That's what has to happen is we can't have experts like you and me in the critical path. Chasing them around. We can't, it's, it, there's, I mean, there's just too much software being built. We have to empower them to do it themselves. I agree, I would really like that. <laughs> QN was saying standards, but with the best tool for the job. I like that, I like that. Okay, Jeff, so thank you so much. I think we got all the questions out of everyone that we're gonna get. And yep. that was a really great demo and a really, really good explanation of so many different things. Well, thanks everybody, appreciate your time today. Let me know, uh, connect to me on LinkedIn if you'd like. If you, I, uh, I tend to get a lot of questions about AppSec there, so feel free to reach out. Awesome, you can also follow him on Twitter at Planet Level. Did I get that right? right? Awesome. Okay, cool. Thank you so much.